Matthew chapter 17, verse 11, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. So before the coming of the Lord, there must be a restoration of the ancient message, the gospel as it was preached from the beginning. The gospel always stood on two legs. And the one leg is, of course, the Messiah. And the other leg is the law of God. Because why do we have the turmoil that we have in the world today? Why is this planet in rebellion? Because the devil rebelled in heaven against God's statutes. And then he continued with his rebellion by gaining Adam and Eve to his side. And since then, we've had this problem. The definition of sin is that it is the transgression of the law. And Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And he said, not one jot or one tittle will by any means disappear from the law until all things are accomplished. The rich young, young ruler that came to Jesus said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, keep the commandments. I've kept them all my life. And Jesus lists the second tablet to him, and he says, I've done that. And then he says, one thing you lack. You must love the Lord your God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with everything that you have. So sell everything and follow me. And what was the result? Now, why did he say that? Because the rich young ruler had no problem with the second tablet of the law. Honor your father and your mother, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bring false testimony. All of these issues do not covet your neighbor's goods, and uh, etc. He had no problem with that. His problem was that he had another deity, his possessions and his money. And God said, would you prepare, be prepared to give it up, to follow me? It's not that God expects everyone to give everything up. It was a test. And I'm sure he would have, like Job, after losing everything, been rewarded with much more had he, <coughs> had he remained faithful. But how readest thou? Keep the commandments. If you want to have access to the tree of life, keep the commandments. Why did Jesus have to die? Because the law could not be compromised. It's much easier to take the law away, because where there's no law, there's no transgression. Isn't that true? And that would have resolved the issue. So anyone who upholds the law in today's age is considered a legalist. Because we have, a, we have a, a system in the world where people claim that we are under grace. If we are under grace, that means that we have been pardoned. Pardoned from what? From transgression of the law, obviously. But if there is no law, there's no transgression, so why would you need grace? So grace and law are inseparable. You cannot, you cannot separate the two. So what is this message that the final Elijah must bring to restore all things? So let's first look at what the first Elijah did. Because there was more than one Elijah. There was the original Elijah, and then there was a typological Elijah and a final Elijah. 1 Kings 18, verse 17, And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. So the commandments are the issue at stake in the first Elijah. Then there was a second Elijah. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist was a herald of the first coming of Christ. 
John the Baptist had a special message. He had to prepare the way so that people's hearts could be receptive to receive Jesus Christ. So what was the role of John the Baptist according to Scripture? Luke chapter 1 verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. It doesn't say everyone, does it? For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. So he was under a special vow. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Now there's a type in there. From his very inception, he would be filled by the Holy Ghost. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Does it say all of them? No. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. So here we know that he is a type of the first Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So there must be a change of heart, a change of thinking. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is the task of this Elijah. And thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before his face, the face of the Lord, to prepare his ways. Now, these are the issues. To give knowledge of salvation. Unto the people by the remission of their sins. Knowledge of salvation. What did John the Baptist say when he saw Jesus approaching for baptism? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. Now the Lamb, of course, typified the Messiah that would die. And why would he die? Because of sin. What is sin? Transgression of the law. We are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. There is not one righteous, no, not one. So even John the Baptist, though he gave this message, fell under that category, right? He was someone who needed to be saved by grace just like everyone else. And he had to give knowledge of salvation. Salvation lies in a person. Salvation doesn't lie within myself. I cannot pick myself up by my bootstraps if I'm dead. And I was dead in transgression. So only a Savior who has life in himself to impart it to others can give me life when I'm dead. So salvation is in Christ and in Christ alone. That's why I pointed to him. But you can see that the issue of sin is also involved. The tender of mercy of God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness. So this message has to go to those who know nothing. And in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. Now what is the way of peace? Psalms 119 verse 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law. And Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, To fear God and keep his commandments, this is the entire duty of God, of man. This is the entire duty of man. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Now why was he in the deserts? He He wasn't accepted in the mainstream. He didn't attend the great colleges. He was a simple fellow. He didn't have the education of the Pharisees. And he was in the desert. That's also a type. Israel also spent time in the desert. That's where God deals with us, in the desert of this life. He deals with us and teaches us his way. Now, who will be the final Elijah that has to come and bring this message? Well, the book of Revelation reveals the characteristics of the remnant. Now, I'm sure that everyone sitting here was not born into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I certainly wasn't. I was an atheist. I was born and raised a Roman Catholic. I came from a family 
where my mother was Lutheran. And uh, the very last thing that anybody could ever have told me was that I would become a member of this church. There must be an easier way than this, right? Surely there must be an easier way. And then you attend one of their services and you see that they all look weird. They are weird. They look funny, they talk funny, and they eat funny. There's no doubt about it. They're weird. What are the characteristics? Well, Jeremiah tells us how God compares his people, what imagery he uses. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. So his people, Zion, thou art my people, he compares them to a woman. That's why Jesus is the bridegroom and his church is the bride. He compares her to a woman. Corinthians, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, jealousy because I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So here's this image of the woman. And then the Bible will tell us about the conflict that exists between the woman, which is God's church, and the forces of evil. Revelation chapter 12. And the woman. So who's that? That's the church. Fled into the wilderness. Where was John the Baptist? Always in the wilderness. Where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. All right? A thousand two hundred and three score days. The reformers, all of them, agreed that this was the period of papal dominance. All the reformers agreed with that. Luther, Calvin, Baxter, Cranmer, Knox, you name them. This was the period of papal supremacy. So who was the woman that had to flee into the solitary places from the wrath of this persecution? The true harborers of God's word. So from the very beginning, it would have been the Valdenses, and it would have been the Albigenses, and it would have been the Church of the East, the Syrian Church. And the Syrian Church had its base in Antioch. And from Antioch, the message spread not only through Asia, but right up into the East, up into China. It spread all the way into India, and the present day, Iran, Iraq, all of those areas is where Christianity in its uncorrupted form spread. There was no Islam there. It didn't exist. There were the original pagan religions, and amongst these groups, this religion spread. And the manuscripts associated with this knowledge base came from Antioch. And the Apostle Thomas preached the gospel as far as India. And in India, there were groups of Christians that were called Thomasites from that apostle. And it's interesting that the Valdensias, the Albigensias, the church in the East, and the church as far as China and India, all were Sabbath keepers. The message also went down into Africa via the eunuch that was reached by Philip. And the Ethiopian church and the African church kept Sabbath. It also spread all the way through into the southern part of uh, Spain and North Africa. They were all Sabbath-keeping nations. Now, three were destroyed, remember? The Vandals, the Ostrogoths, and the Heruli. They were probably all Sabbath keepers. And that history has been obliterated. Now, we know that the church in the East all kept Sabbath because when <coughs> Francis Xavier, who was one of the co-founders of the Jesuits, traveled around Africa with Vasco da Gama's fleet and came to India, 
on a trade mission. He was the Jesuit that went along. He found Christians in India that were keeping the Sabbath. It totally freaked him out. So he instituted the Inquisition in Goa to destroy them. And the same happened in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, they kept the Sabbath. And you can trace the Sabbath all through the black nations that they kept the Sabbath day. And there again it was the Jesuits that came in and caused factions, separated the prince and his followers from the king and his followers, and there was war. Until finally they came to the point where they kept both, depending on which faction you were in. So Sabbath was a big issue. And the Waldensians were all Sabbath keepers. The Albigensians lived in France. So they related to the Waldensians. And they were destroyed by the Franciscans. So they persecuted them until they totally obliterated them. So for 1,260 years, the church fled from persecution. Interesting, when the Reformation started, the Reformation brought back to life the knowledge of salvation in Jesus Christ, the knowledge that your morality must be based on the Scripture and the Scripture alone, and that salvation was by faith. But all the Reformers, whether it was Calvin, whether it was Martin Luther, whether it was Melanchthon, whether it was Wesley, all of them agreed that the law was binding. The law was binding. But they had a problem. And that was that because they had come out of Catholicism, they adopted many of the norms and customs of Catholicism. And amongst others, they also adopted the Sunday. And when it came to the shove at the Council of Trent, there was this massive argument as to what should be the basis of morality and teaching and doctrine. Should it be tradition or should it be the Word of God? And the Reformers all said, it's the Word of God. And the Catholics said, no, it's the Word of God as interpreted through tradition. And the Church has the final say on what will happen. And for a while there, Protestantism had the ascendancy until the Archbishop of Reggio walked into the Council of Trent and said that Protestantism cannot be regarded as a religion of its own. It can only be considered a rebellion. And the reason that he gave was very profound. He said, if you Protestants based your teaching on the Scripture, you should all be keeping Saturday as the Sabbath. But you don't, you keep Sunday. And therefore you are following a command of the Roman Catholic Church. Therefore you are a rebellion. Therefore, since you are following tradition against your so-called guide, the Scriptures, you are a rebellion. And that ended the debate and the split was final. Today we see that in the Ecumenical Council, many people and many denominations are returning to Rome. But for 1,260 years, this church was persecuted. Were the Reformers persecuted? Yes. Many of them died at the stake. Many of them were tortured in the Inquisition. And even after 1798, when the Inquisition, which was officially run by the Dominicans, came to an end, it didn't come to an end in Rome where the Inquisition in Rome was run by the Jesuits. It continued even through that period of the so-called wound when the papacy lost its dominions. So let's continue the story. And when the dragon, that's the devil, saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. This is a reference to the church of God out of which the Messiah would come. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into a wilderness, into a place where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time. So this Hebrew parallelism, it gives you the same time period in the three and a half years of Daniel 
which all the reformers again agreed this was the period of papal dominance because they took a day for a year from the face of the serpent. So God has always been with his church, but his church has never been mainstream. His church has always been the wilderness church, maligned, disregarded, hated, called heretics, persecuted. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood, the Bible tells us. The waters you saw are peoples and multitudes and nations and kings. After the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Did they do that? Did the nations attack the woman? Absolutely. Absolutely. The Spaniards, under Alva and his troops, annihilated and obliterated Protestantism in Europe. The whole of Belgium was a Protestant nation. Today, there's only one little town that's still Protestant, because they missed it. Everybody else was decimated. The Dutch, Holland. Holland cons was a large country. All of Belgium consisted of it. The north of France was part of Holland. They literally chased them into the sea. Alva and his troops. And there were two groups. They were fighting each other. And the Jesuits were bringing gold from South America, America in their galleys to finance the war. And they used slave labor in the reductions where they used the Indians in South America and set up their power base. And there were two groups in, in, uh, in Holland. There was the Dutch East India Company that had the trade utes, roots, sort of the, count of Piet, Piet, or the counterpart of Vasco da Gama to have trade with the East. And they also went round Africa and they Eventually, because of the persecution, many of those Christians settled in the south of Africa, South Africa. That became a Protestant enclave. Others fled to North America and to the new colonies in Australia and etc. But the bulk of the Dutch and the Huguenots, the French Huguenots that fled, came to Southern Africa. The Puritans fled to North America. Did you know that the Dutch had a, a company called the West Indian Company? Nobody knows about them in history because they were pirates. But they were government-funded pirates. And their only task was to intercept the Jesuit galleys with the gold, to rob them of the gold, bring it to Amsterdam, and use the money to finance the war against Alva. So this is history. There was massive persecution. So the flood did overwhelm these people, and they fled. So he cast this water, the nations as a flood, after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away, to be dissipated. And the earth helped the woman. So that's where they are not, the waters, the multitudes, the nations. So they fled to South Africa. They fled to North America and they fled to all those regions where Protestantism became the religion. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. And he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Can you give me a date? If the woman was persecuted for 1,260 days, when did those 1,260 days end? According to Reformed theology, 1798, because the papacy took its chair in 538 AD, its political power, lost it in 1798, and then regained it again in 1929 under Mussolini. Fine. So this dragon... Satan was wroth with the woman and he went to make war with the remnant of this woman's seed. And then there are the criteria which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Two important criteria of the last remnant. So what is a remnant? A remnant is that which remains of the original. Now what was the original? The original was the church that Christ established. And... Although it was attacked and some of it lost some of its first love, it still remained God's people through the ages. And 
after this persecution period stopped and people became complacent, God was to restore the message that was preached originally. So it's what remains of the original. Revelation 14 verse 12 says, Here's the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So obviously the commandments are important. So this is why we have this big issue that the law is done away with. We're under grace, we're not under law. You can't be under grace if there is no law. The two cannot be separated from one another. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter into the gate of the city. If you love me, keep my commandments. John goes even further. He who says he loves me and keeps not my commandments is a what? Is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So you cannot separate obedience from uh, salvation. So the two distinguishing characteristics of God's remnant must be that they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Is that correct? Now what is the testimony of Jesus? The testimony of Jesus is what is written in the scripture by the prophets. That is what Jesus testified to as truth. So the prophetic gift throughout the ages is the testimony. Question. Were there prophets of old that were not canonical? That were not taken up in the canon? Sure. Hulda was a prophetess. Nathan was a prophet. Is there a book of Nathan in the Bible? Is there a book of Hulda in the Bible? The daughters of Philip were prophetesses. Are there daughters of Philip's gospels written? No. So nevertheless, this was spirit of prophecy. So what is the testimony of Jesus? Revelation 19 verse 10, John is talking to the angel that brings him the revelation and I fell at his feet to worship him and the angel said, don't do it. I'm just a fellow servant and, uh, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. And then he defines it. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So here's another question. If the, the last group to bring the message has to keep the commandments and have the testimony, must they have the prophetic gift, yes or no? They must have it. It must be there. So God's last day church would keep his commandments and have the gift of prophecy. It's biblical. It's weird, but it's biblical. Now, when does this last message come into effect? Now, if you take the book of Revelation, the first portion is historic continues, remember? So it goes through all the history and repeats history in various facets. And it ends in the great conflict, which is Revelation chapter 11, 12, 13, 14 to 17. And that's the great final message and conflict between good and evil on this planet. So you have the historic arm, and then you have the eschatological arm, the second half of Revelation. Now chapter 10 introduces the information that sets the final message apart from the previous messages. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was, as it were, the, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now this word angel is Elohim, which can also mean God. So here he came down, and his description is exactly the same as what Daniel saw, and it's the same as what Isaiah saw when he said, Woe is me, I am undone. I've seen with my eyes God. I'm a man of unclean lips and living amongst the people of unclean lips. Woe is me. But then God touches his lips with a burning coal and says, your sins are purged. And then he asks the question, whom shall I send? And uh, Isaiah answers, send me. You see, even though we are of unclean lips, living amongst the people of unclean lips, God will still use us if we're willing. He doesn't use us because we're better than other people. We're pathetic. God doesn't use us because we have a special talent or a special gift that he desperately needs. 
because he can make a stone cry out. He doesn't need us. But it's an honor to be used, if he does, be used by him. So here is this angel. So this is a vision of Christ as he appears. And he has one foot on the land and one foot on the water. And in his hand, a little book, open. Now a book is a scroll. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth. So he covers the whole, all the bases, all the nations. He's, he's in control of everything. Lift up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which therein are. There should be time no longer. This is a fascinating prophecy. So he has a book in his, in his hand, and the book is open. But this book at some stage had been sealed. And then he quotes this section. Now, what do you call this section? Who created heaven, things therein, earth, things therein, sea, things therein. Where do we find that? Find that in the fourth commandment. Correct. Worship God, give glory to Him, the one who is the Creator. And the fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of your Lord, your God. And then who must not do any work? Why? Because in six days the Lord created the heavens, the sea, the earth, and the springs of water. So this is called the seal of God. So the seal of God will somehow become prominent in this message. And to 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This prophecy, the 2,300 day prophecy, is the longest prophecy in the Bible. And the interesting thing about this prophecy, the last portion of this prophecy is actually sealed. Because Daniel wants to know what is the issue regarding this prophecy, and the, and the angel, who was Gabriel, tells Daniel, go your way, this is sealed until the time of the end. And now we continue, verses 8 to 11 in chapter 10, Revelation, go and take the little book, the scroll, which is now open in the hand of the angel, take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey and as soon as I had eaten it my belly was bitter. And he said unto me thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues and kings. Now what can this mean? So he takes the scroll which is the word of God. It's a prophecy. He eats it. Sweet. Turns bitter. And he's told, you must prophesy again. Is it possible that he thought prophecy might be at an end? But now he's told, you must prophesy again. Let's go into it. Jeremiah 15, 16. The words were found, thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So we are to internalize God's word. This is the metaphor, to eat it. Ezekiel tells us a little more, chapter 3, 3 and 4. He said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll, with this scroll, with this book, that I give thee, that's the prophecy, and I did eat it. And it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, Go, get thee unto the house of Israel and speak my words unto them. So this is what it means when God says, eat the scroll. Internalize it, understand it, and then preach it. And they were told, you must prophesy again. And why did it turn bitter? Because in Ezekiel's case, it was sweet. God's word is sweet. Why did it turn bitter? Did it turn bitter because they made a mistake and didn't understand it? And they thought that it meant something else. And they thought, wow, this is wonderful news. This is sweet. And then it didn't happen. And they were bitterly disappointed. Is it possible? 
Revelation 10, 11, you must prophesy again. To whom must you prophesy again? To many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Seems to me like a universal message, doesn't it? Luke 24, 21, but we trust that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Who said these words? Wasn't it the two men who walked to Emmaus? Here they were, totally dejected, walking with a long face because their great hope had been crucified. They thought the kingdom was going to be announced. Jesus had entered into Jerusalem under the fanfare of Hosannas. Palm branches had been thrown before him and one week later on the Friday he was dead. Their hopes were dashed. And as they were walking dejectedly, absolutely saddened and bitter in heart, the third man joins them. And they say to him, We trust that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, this is the third day since these things were done. Totally dejected. They finally get to the house and Jesus is going to walk by and they say, no, 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 come inside. There's a lesson in that. Jesus can walk you by. You have to invite him in. And when he took the bread and he broke it and he handed it to them, who did, he rec who did they recognize? They recognized Jesus. And on the way, he opened to them the scripture and they say, didn't our hearts burn when he opened up the scripture? Did they understand it before? No. Had Jesus told them many times that he would die and, r and rise from the dead? Yes. But the thing was, gone from them. It was sealed from their minds. They didn't understand it. Only when he broke the bread did he understand it. Why did God allow his disciples to have such a bitter disappointment even though he told them? Why did he allow it? I'll tell you why. He allowed it because there were so many hangers on that were shouting Hosanna and were hoping for the kingdom for the wrong reasons. They didn't want repentance of heart. They wanted to partake in whatever was going to come their way. So the bread and fish, hangers-on, scattered when Jesus hung on the cross. And what was left was a tiny little remnant that said, surely we weren't deceived by him. And with that little core, he could work. And when they understood the message, then they ran back to the disciples and told them. And the disciples were so excited and said, wow, now we understand. Did they? No, they didn't even believe them. Because they had to have the experience as well. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So you must prophesy again to many nations, peoples, tongues, and people. And here they are. What must the, the nations hear? They must hear the everlasting gospel. Now, hasn't the everlasting gospel been preached? Sure. But it's been divorced of its setting. The Jews preached what? The commandments of God. The commandments of God. What did they do to the Messiah? They crucified him. Then comes modern Christianity and teaches, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. What do they abolish? The law. the law. So the Jews keep the commandments, they reject the Messiah. The modern Christian accepts the Messiah and rejects the law. That's half a gospel. When Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus himself confronted them and he took a sheep and he took off the coat and he covered their nakedness. So the animal died, the animal died typifying Christ and he clothed them with his righteousness. 
That's the everlasting gospel. It's never changed. Cain and Abel. Abel sacrificed the lamb, typifying the lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. Cain said, no, I'm going to bring my own works. Here they are. Be satisfied with that. And his offer was rejected. And ever since then, Cain has been in enmity with Abel and has been trying to kill him to this very day. That's just the way it is. All right, so the everlasting gospel must be preached. But then there's a special message. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. The hour of his judgment has come. Does that mean the last day is here? Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. So when we have to give glory to God who created all things, can the remnant be evolutionists, yes or no? Obviously not. So can the church that preaches the final message make a synodal take a synod position that we came about by evolution, yes or no? No. But all the major Protestant churches have done so, included the Catholic Church. They've taken an official position that the way we came into existence was not by the creation of God, but by evolutionary processes. So this has to be glorified. And then they followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now who is Babylon? Well, we've dealt with it in all these lectures. The Bible clearly tells us who is Babylon. It consists of three parts. It consists of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Isn't that right? And the reformers all agreed that the beast is who? Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism, false religion. You get to heaven via the system and other mediators and Jesus is led to, side, to the side. So that's the beast. The false prophet we read about in Revelation chapter 13. That is the image to the beast, that is Protestantism, that has returned to the fold of Rome and rejected the truth as they once believed it. And we looked at the document, remember, where we looked at what the Lutheran Church and the Protestant churches have said, and we can see that every single doctrine that made them Protestants has been given up in the joint declarations, and they are again following the principles of Rome. So then they become fallen in terms of proclaiming the gospel. So Babylon is fallen. And she's made the nations drink of the wine, which is doctrine, of the wrath of her fornication, that is becoming apostate to God, following man rather than God. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So there's a great warning to the world. You must worship God. The hour of his judgment has come. You must preach the everlasting gospel. You must say Babylon is fallen. Why it is fallen? Why, when they signed the unity of religion agreement, is that an apostasy towards God? Because then Jesus is negated. It's no longer salvation by grace in Christ. And then do not follow the mark of the beast. And Rome has said the mark of her ecclesiastical powers that she shifted the Sabbath from the Saturday to the Sunday. And that's the warning, the final warning to be given to the world. Revelation 14, 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So the three angels' messages are, the hour of his judgment has come, coupled with the everlasting gospel and the fact that Jesus must be lifted up 
as the creator of this world. Babylon has fallen. They've decided to return to an earthly ruler from which they had separated. And so they are fallen and do not accept the principles of Roman Catholicism and their law which negates the law of God. And then it has to be a worldwide movement. Matthew 24 also says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. So who does this? Who in the world today arises after the 1,260 days, after the fall of papal Rome in its political form, who arises at that time, keeps the commandments of God, has the testimony of Jesus, preaches the three angels' messages to the entire world. There's only one organization that does it. There is no other. And that's the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist because these people are great, but because this is a prophetic movement. I wouldn't even call it a church. I would call it a movement. Because originally it wasn't even going to be a church. It was just calling people out of all denominations back to obedience to God's precepts and to a realization that we have to follow the commandments of God and be obedient to Jesus Christ and accept Him as our Savior. It also has a message of separation. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. So it seems like exclusivity, but it's not exclusivity, it's gathering. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Now it's interesting that around about this time period, 1798, by the way, when it comes to the 1260 day prophecy which ends in 1798, Daniel chapter 12 says, at the end of that comes the time of the end. So there's a time of the end which starts in 1798 and goes to uh, the time when Jesus will come. At the same period, when this message must go into the world, Freemasonry was organized in its modern form. Always existed as separate occult organizations under the Knights Templars, etc., etc., but it is organized in its, in its modern form around about this time. Spiritualism makes its first appearance at the end of the 2300-day prophecy. 1844, the Fox sisters move into the house where the wrappings began. Theosophy, where Lucifer is lifted up as the true son of God with a special prophetess, Blavatsky, arises at that time. Many, many false prophets, many denominations start with false prophets. Joseph Smith, who teaches that sin is a gift which gives man the joy of taking part in whatever. I'm not going to go into details. Jehovah's Witnesses, they teach that Jesus is not God. And the Christian science movement, which also has a female prophetess, which mingles Bible and science together in such a way that it becomes occult. What does the word ecumenical mean? The word ecumenical is derived from the Greek term oikomene, which may be translated as the whole inhabited world. This is the World Council of Churches webpage, directly. Okay. Priest J. Cornell says, The final object of ecumenism, is, as Catholics conceive it, is unity in the faith, worship, and the acknowledgement of the supreme spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome. This is what it is. So when they sign the Charta Ecumenica, they are accepting apostolic succession which means that you are accepting the authority of a pope who makes dogmas which are totally contrary to the Bible. You cannot be saved through the system. You cannot have forgiveness by a priest. 
You have to have forgiveness by Jesus Christ. So this final movement, being a separate movement, cannot be associated with ecumenism. Revelation 13, verse 3, And the world wandered after the beast. So the world had the mindset. Remember we spoke about the O, wander, think. Think like him and follow him. Malachi 4, verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So just as there was a typical forerunner of Jesus Christ, who was called Elijah, Elias in the Greek, John the Baptist, who made straight the ways of the Lord. By the way, did John the Baptist elevate the law of God, yes or no? What did he say to Herod the king? It is not lawful for you to have Herodias as your wife because she belongs to your brother Philip. It is not lawful. What law was he breaking? Which number? The seventh commandment. That's the law of relationship. Two commandments in heaven were established in the Garden of Eden. God married Adam and Eve and he blessed marriage. Did he? Yes. So the law of relationship between man and woman was blessed. What else did he bless in Eden? The Sabbath. Genesis chapter 2. And God blessed the Sabbath. And he set it aside as a special day of worship. So it cannot be a Jewish day if it comes from the Garden of Eden. So the two institutions that deal with relationships. Do you think the devil will hate those? Mm -hmm. By the way, what has he done with the one which says that a marriage is between a man and a woman? He's obliterated it, hasn't he? Totally obliterated it. So what's his next target going to be? Obviously the Sabbath. So this has to be restored in the same way. So would you agree that according to the scripture, the last message will be brought by a group called the remnant in the Bible that keep the commandments of God. Is that biblical? Is it biblical that they must have the testimony or the spirit of prophecy and the faith of Jesus? So it must be a Christian movement and it must be more than faith in Jesus. It must be faith of Jesus. What's the difference? The faith in Jesus... Many people can have faith in Jesus, but can you have the faith of Jesus? The faith of Jesus was prepared to go to the cross. And every single one of the disciples, except John, died an unnatural death. Every single one. And even he, according to tradition, was thrown into oil, boiling oil. So they all were persecuted. If they just had the faith in Jesus, they could have been like all that multitude that scattered when he hung on the cross. You need more than that. You need the faith of Jesus. And he arose out of the great disappointment after 1798 because they received a message, they took it, and they discussed the scroll, internalized it, and the only scroll that is sealed in the whole of the Bible is the last portion of Daniel, chapter 8, the 2,300 evenings and mornings, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And they interpreted it, misunderstood it, were terribly disappointed because they thought the sanctuary referred to the earth, and Jesus didn't come. They thought he was going to come again. But they must preach the three angels' messages. And it must be a worldwide movement. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 12 and 3. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. This is a prophetic view of what the remnant must do. The restorer of paths to dwell in. Now where does the breach come in? The breach is in the wall. Now the wall is always a symbol of the law of God which protects you. So the law was around the people of Israel. But there was a breach in the wall. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, then I will let you ride on the heights, like your father Jacob. 
So again, the Sabbath will be an issue according to prophecy. So the final reforms must be of a very similar nature. The Elijah message was one of repentance and a call to follow God with the whole heart and to keep his commandments. John the Baptist, the first antitype of Elijah, had the same clarion call, as will the final Elijah. He said, make straight the way of the Lord. He had to set straight the gospel. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins. And he rebuked kings and said, you're not doing what is lawful. You're not keeping the commandments of God. What did it cost him? It cost him his head, yes. So the Advent movement arose at the end of the 18th century. It was an international movement. And it came at the low tide of human spirituality. America had witnessed the turmoils of war, bloodshed. Europe had witnessed the French Revolution, uh, which had sacrificed truth to the goddess of reason. And men had become like brute beasts rather than in the image of God. And in the United States, Leonard Woolsey Bacon summarized the moral standing as follows. He wrote, this is the great history of the American church. The closing years of the 18th century show the lowest low water mark of the lowest ebb tide of spiritual life in the history of the American church. The demoralization of army life, the fury political factions, the catchpenny materialist morality of Franklin, the philosophic deism of men like Jefferson, and the popular rivalry of Thomas Paine, one of the most revolting occultists, to have power enough to influence constitutions, unbelievable, had wrought together with other untoward influences to bring about the conditions of things which to the eye of little faith seemed almost desperate. So at this low water tide, Mark, French Revolution, God being excluded, all of these issues, suddenly God pumps life into the message. There arose what termed the Great Revival. People like Dwight Moody. What a, what a tremendous man. I like Dwight Moody. In Europe and America, there was a great emphasis on the second coming of Jesus. The prophecies of Daniel were studied again. Revelation was taken under scrutiny. And then the great Bible societies were created. The British and Foreign Bible Societies were formed in 1804. American Bible Societies in 1816, as well as the American Home Missionary Society. So suddenly Bibles are being distributed throughout the world, such as never before in history. Surely God was about to do something. And one of the most prominent preachers at this time, heralding the second coming, was a most unlikely candidate by the name of William Miller. Why was he unlikely? Because originally he was influenced by his friends and he was a deist. Now a deist believes that there's a God, but that God doesn't care about what happens down here. He kick-started the creation and then left it to itself. He's not interested at all. He's not associated with this earth. Not at all. Of course, deism and Jesus Christ, who comes down and touches the leper with his finger, or as far as the east is removed from the west. Because in Christ, God demonstrates his care and his love, and he comes down and touches sin-sick humanity. So deism... Cannot be true. But Willow, Miller was a deist. He had no formal religious training. Later he became disillusioned with deism and then he started to attend the Baptist congregation. And in 1816 he became a serious Bible student, allowing nothing but the Bible to be its own expositor. Interestingly enough, he was also a Freemason. You can't get much worse than that combination, can you? This is what he wrote. While thus studying the scripture, I became satisfied if all the prophecies which have been fulfilled in the past are any criterion by which to judge of the manner of the fulfillment of those which are future, that the popular views of the spiritual reign of Christ, the temporal millennium before the end of the world, and the Jews' return are not sustained by the word of God. For I found that all the scriptures on which those favorite theories are based are as clearly expressed as are those that were literally 
fulfilled at the first advent or at any other period in the past. I found it plainly taught in the scriptures that Jesus Christ will again descend to this earth, coming in the clouds of heaven in all the glory of the Father, and that at his coming the kingdom and dominion under the whole heaven will be given to him and the saints of the Most High who will possess it forever and ever. At the coming, the bodies of the righteous dead will be raised and all the righteous living will be changed from a corruptible to an incorruptible, from a mortal to an immortal state, and that they will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so they will reign with Christ. I found that only the only millennium taught in the Word of God is the thousand years which intervene between the first resurrection and that of the rest of the dead as inculcated in the 20th of Revelation. And it must necessarily follow the personal coming of Christ and the regeneration of the earth, that till Christ's coming and the end of the world, the righteous and the wicked are to continue together on the earth, and that the horn of the papacy is to war against the saints until his appearing and kingdom, when it will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. We did that verse by verse, is that correct? It's biblical. It's what the reformers believed. It must necessarily follow that the various portions of Scripture that refer to the millennial state must have their fulfillment after the resurrection of all the saints that sleep in Jesus. I also found that the promises respecting Israel's restoration as are applied by the apostle to all who are Christ's. The putting on of Christ constituting them Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Is that biblical? Yes. So William Miller put aside deism. William Miller decided he's going to put away the teachings of the popular theology of the day. He's going to read what says the scripture. So regarding prophetic interpretation, Miller applied the day-year principle. Question, did the reformers apply the day-year principle? Yes, the Lutheran reformers applied it. The Calvinist reformers applied it. John Knox applied it. They all applied the day-year principle. This is nothing new. And he concluded that the 2,300-day prophecy began with a 70-week period in Daniel 9.24 and that it would terminate about 1843. And it was brought, thus brought in 1818 at the close of my two-year study of the scripture to the solemn conclusion that in about 25 years from that time, the affairs of this earth would be wound up. The sanctuary would be cleansed. They thought the sanctuary was the earth. They were wrong. It was a bitter disappointment. But there was nothing wrong with the prophecy. Because if you take the 70-week prophecy and you take the 70-week portion, the first part of the 2,300, then you come exactly to Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And if you don't apply the day-year principle, you don't come to Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Why do you think Sanhedrin 17b, the Talmudic books, say that you should not calculate the 70 weeks? Because you would come to Jesus Christ and then the whole Jewish economy would be gone. So it works out exactly. And if you then complete it to 2,300, it works out to 1844. But they made a mistake, and they didn't take into account the zero in the middle and the fact that the Jewish year wasn't like ours, but spread over a portion of one and a portion of another. And then later, a man by the name of Samuel Snow, he e emphasized the autumn Jewish seventh month Tishri, and they came to the conclusion that it would be 1844. Now this is William Miller's letter regarding Freemasonry, because everybody says, you know, how can anybody speak any sense if he was a Freemason? This is his handwritten document. He says, I, William Miller, feeling willing to do everything that the gospel may permit me to do, to conciliate the feelings of my brethren in Christ, to hereby renounce my connection with the institution of masonry. And again, to have no fellowship with any practice that may be incompatible with the word of God amongst the masons. If God chose only the best and the holiest and the greatest, then nobody would have ever heard anything of the gospel. Martin Luther, what was he before he became the greatest star of Protestantism? Wasn't he a Roman Catholic priest? Steeped in all kinds of mysticism, yes or no? What was Tyndall? He was a Roman Catholic priest. What was Wycliffe? 
It was a Roman Catholic priest. Just because you were doesn't mean you're going to stay. What was I? I was an atheist and an occultist and a Roman Catholic, all thrown into one. I was the biggest catastrophe under the sun. Still am, in many ways. So Miller's preaching led to what was called the Great Advent Awakening. It didn't start a new church. It happened in all the denominations. And people like Josiah Litch, who was a Methodist minister, joined. Charles Fitch, who was of the Congregational Church, joined. Himes joined. He was pastor of the Second Christian Church of Boston. So this happened in all the churches. It wasn't a new denomination. And then they started a, a newspaper which was called The Midnight Cry and they started handing out thousands of copies. And about between 1843 and 1844, one million people attended their meetings. And the population of the United States was only 17 million. So one in 17 heard the message. And then the peculiar people who were associated with this message, Josiah Litch, Century, 19th century physician and uh, minister of the Methodist Episcopal Church. He started predicting from the day, year principle, the Ottoman fall, Ottoman Empire's fall, and he was accurate to the day. And then they started under Himes to publish a magazine called Signs of the Times, and they organized a great tent in which they took these meetings from one area to another. This was not a church. This was a movement. This was a gathering movement. And then after the great disappointment, when they had interpreted the scroll that was now open in the hand, they realized that they had made a mistake. And there was just a handful left that were bitter, although the message had been sweet. And they studied the scriptures and they began to understand what it meant when the scripture says, and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And then the five pillars of Adventism were established. Number one, the sanctuary doctrine. The sanctuary doctrine is the most amazing doctrine in the scripture. Because the Bible says that the gospel was preached to the ancients. How was the gospel preached to the ancients if the Holy Spirit was only poured out at Pentecost and Jesus <coughs> could be preached? It was preached in type. When the Jew came to the sanctuary, he came with his lamb and he entered into the sanctuary, which was this wall of white linen with one door. And he entered in with his lamb and was confronted with the altar of burnt offering. And there stood the high priest and tied the lamb to the altar. And the Jew would take his hands and lay them on the, on the lamb and confess his sins and then with his own hand sacrifice the little lamb. So the white linen on the outside represents the righteousness of Christ. Jesus says, I am the door. You enter into the door. You enter into the righteousness of Christ. You realize you are a sinner. You confess your sins over the Lamb. The Lamb typifies Jesus. You are responsible for the death of the Lamb. The Lamb is burnt and sacrificed, but the blood of the Lamb is sprinkled on the outside and the priest takes a small portion and he, after it has been cooked, about the size of a pea, eats it. Which means he internalizes the sins that have in type been transferred to the Lamb, because the high priest now represents Jesus Christ, who becomes our high priest. And then he goes to the laver, is the next step. That's the washing of rebirth. And the priest takes an offering of his own and enters into the holy place, and he puts the blood of that sacrifice, which he has also confessed his own sins, plus in type all the sins that have been confessed before had internalized, he places them on the horns of the altar. Thus the record of sin is kept in the sanctuary. And there's the light, the candlestick, the, the seven candles, candlestick, the menorah, Jesus the light of the world, the altar of incense, Jesus our intercessor, 
the incense is the prayers of the saints made acceptable through the merits of Jesus. The altar of showbread, Jesus, the sinless one, the bread without leaven, the one who was sacrificed for us. And then behind the curtain, the law. And the law is in the Ark of the Covenant. And the law sentences me to death. Because the law cannot save me, but it can tell me that I'm a sinner. And above the law, the mercy seat. And the mercy seat is exactly as high as the grid outside of the altar of burnt offering. The mercy seat, which represents Jesus, shields me from the condemnation of the law. What a beautiful symbol. And that mercy is exactly 1.5 cubits high, exactly as high as the grid on which the lamb is sacrificed. God's mercy is as high as his justice. Mercy and justice kiss each other at the cross. And then above the mercy seat, the angels that look down upon it in reverence and wonder at this great salvation that God would condescend to die in my stead and in your stead and take the condemnation of the law upon himself. That's the plan of salvation. And how will this whole thing end? Finally, the sanctuary will be cleansed from the record of sin. All the confessed sins will be cleansed. So on the Day of Atonement, which symbolized judgment, the high priest would sacrifice a goat. There were two goats, a scapegoat and the Lord's goat. They cast lots. The Lord's goat was sacrificed. And he entered in and he'd made atonement with that blood in the most holy place. And then he would come out and atone for the holy and he would come out and then place his hands on the scapegoat and the scapegoat would be led into the desert. In type, the record of sin that had been forgiven was placed on the scapegoat. What does that mean in terms of the plan of salvation? When we stand before God one day, how complete is our salvation? Absolutely complete. Even the record of sin will have been removed. In other words, you will stand before God as though there is no record of your sin, as though you had never sinned. Can we forgive like that? Can we forgive like that? We find it so hard to forgive. If somebody wrongs us and that person says, I'm sorry, how are we supposed to forgive? Completely, that there is no record of sin. There must not even be a record. So the sanctuary doctrine explains the plan of salvation in type and makes the Jewish economy, the ceremonial law, come to life. And it shows us that it has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ who fulfills every single iota of the Jewish economy down to the coverings and the colors that were involved, the purple, the red, the blue, the blue and the red, the red symbolizing sacrifice, the blue symbolizing obedience. If you join blue and red together, you get purple. So if you have a sacrificial religion and you have the blue of obedience, then you attain to royalty stand standards. And then the doctrine of the second advent. The Bible teaches, I will come again and every eye will see me. And all the verses as to the second coming, it will be a spectacular event. And the Sabbath had to be recognized again. God's law is binding. Not one jot or one tittle will disappear from the law. And the state of the dead and the spirit of prophecy, the state of the dead, all the reformers believed it, Martin Luther believed it, Tyndall believed it, that the dead sleep until the resurrection. But today everybody believes the Roman Catholic version. And of these, the realization emerged of the context of the three angels' messages that had to be preached to the whole world. And then the health message was added. And this would become the right arm of the gospel. And then the people that were involved, by the way, this is fascinating. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, were they led out by a prophet, yes or no? 
Yes, Moses was the prophet. And what was established again? The law. Was the Sabbath established again when they came out of Egypt? Yes, the manna fell. And the manna fell every day. And every day when they tried to gather for two days, it became rotten. But on a Friday, a special miracle was done and it didn't go rotten. Remember that? And the Sabbath was thereby established again by the falling of the manna. And the manna stands for Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life that comes down from heaven. And this beautiful symbolism of the manna, that it didn't go rotten on the Friday, what does that symbolize? That Jesus would not face corruption in the grave. The symbolism is so beautiful. And then Sinai, the law. And what did Moses do? He wrote it down all in a book. And it was placed beside the Ark of the Covenant because God's finger had written the law of God. And this book of the law was to sustain the children of Israel on their journey. And did Moses add a health message? Yes, Leviticus, the clean and unclean, and what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat, and that you should wash your hands when you touch a corpse, and that you should make sure that you live hygienically and do things hygienically. The health message was part of it. Do you think the same should happen at the end when there's an antitypical calling out of the antitypical Egypt and God's people must be restored back to the law, back to the manna, back to considering the body as the temple of the living God? If he did it for typical Israel, why wouldn't he do it for anti-typical Israel? And so two people in particular are very interesting, James and Ellen White. James White was born on the 4th of August, 1821, fifth of nine children, and he suffered as a boy from a weakness of eyesight. Now, he had such a weakness because he was squint, terribly squint. So he went to school at the age of six, couldn't see the blackboard. So the teacher put him in the front row. He still couldn't see the blackboard. He was so squint. So the teacher said, you have to go home. You're not school material. So he had to go home and work on his father's farm until the age of 19. He longed to go to school. He never went to school. And at the age of 19, he became terribly sick, had a terrible fever. Everybody thought he was going to die. And when he recovered from the fever, lo and behold, his eyes were straight. And so he said to his father, I want to go to school. And his father said, are you nuts? You can't go to school. You'll look like an idiot sitting with those little six-year-olds in a school bench. He says, I want to go to school. You know, thank God for mothers who can sometimes twist fathers. And so the father listened to the mother and sent him to school. And he was brilliant. He was such a scholar that within three months he'd caught up to the curriculum. By the end of the year, he'd covered the entire curriculum of the entire schooling. He was excellent in mathematics, in writing, in languages, in all the subjects. In one year, he caught up what takes 12 years to do. Unbelievable. So good that they made him the teacher the following year. <laughs> Unbelievable. And then he married Ellen White, who was Ellen Harmon. Now, she's even more remarkable because she suffered facial injury from a stone that was thrown at her when she was nine years old, which left her half paralyzed and one eye a little lower than the other, so she looked weird. And she only had three years of schooling. So that's third grade. That's all she had. Then she had to leave school. And when she was 17, then she became involved in this message and she received visions. Now people complain about these visions and say, is this possible? So in 1847 she wrote, after I had the vision from God, gave me light and bade me deliver it. But I shrank from it. I was young and I thought they would not receive it from me. 17 years old, who's going to listen to a 17 year old? By the way, how old was the beloved disciple when he became part of the 12 apostles? He was 17. How old was Daniel when he was taken into captivity? He was 17. Isn't this all interesting stuff? The final message to the world, Revelation 10, 9. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me that little book. 
And he said, take it and eat it up, and I shall make thy belly bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. So there came this great disappointment. They interpreted the prophecy of the sanctuary <coughs> will be cleansed as the earth. They didn't realize the beauty of the sanctuary message. So I took the little book and I ate it. And it was sweet. Jesus is coming again. And then it turned bitter. It didn't come. And then I had to prophesy again to many peoples, nations, tongues and kings. So the first angel's message announcing the hour of God's judgment is not the coming of Christ, but the antitype of the great day of atonement that the Jews also kept, which typified preparation for the judgment. Getting a people back into shape, restoring the ancient truths of the Bible as were taught by the disciples and by Jesus himself. Didn't Jesus say, I've not come to abolish the law? Absolutely. So it was designed to separate people from the corrupting influences of the world. And in this message, God had sent to the church a warning, which had it been accepted, would have been corrected the evils that were shutting them away from him. So we read in that great book, Great Controversy, written by Ellen White. So had people all accepted it, it would have been wonderful. Did they all accept Jesus as the Messiah? No. And what happened to Israel in the end? The destruction of Jerusalem, which is a type of the final destruction of this world. Now the other person that became involved in this message was J.N. Andrews. Now look at this one. He quit school at the age of 11. And then he taught himself. And by the end of that process, he spoke seven languages fluently. He could read the Bible in all seven languages. He could recite the New Testament from memory. And he began to observe the seventh-day Sabbath at the age of 17. And by the age of 21, he was a member of the publishing committee. So he is another unschooled fellow. And then another weird individual, Uriah Smith. He lost his leg in 1844 when he was 12 years old, above the knee. Now in those days, if you lost your leg, you got a wooden leg, and you walked like this for the rest of your days. And uh, he felt that he was being held back, so he designed the first ever flexible prosthesis with a bendable knee and ankle joint. And it became so prominent that the, the military took it, and used it for its soldiers. And so it became uh, the invention on which even today's prosthesis are based. At the age of 20, he joined the Adventist movement, and by 21, he was in the publishing work. Loughborough, another strange fellow. He began uh, selling Adventist literature, 35 cents a packet, but he was a very sickly person. So what was he interested in? health. So he started investigating health and wrote a little handbook on health, a brief treatise on physiology and hygiene. Interesting. And one of the strangest fellows was Joseph Bates. <clears throat> now Joseph Bates <clears throat> at the age of 15 became a cabin boy and then they were overwhelmed by pirates and he became a slave and he had to row in the pirate ships. And eventually he managed to escape, and then he uh, eventually became captain of his own ship, and he was a really rough fellow. He's one of the oldest of the three founders of the denomination. Now, what he, what he had is he had a wife that had a beautiful character. Now, he, his greatest fame was that he could spit further than anyone else. <laughs> he could swear more and better than anyone else. And he could drink like a fish. But he had a big uh, case in which he kept his Penny Horrible books and he loved reading them. But his wife always slipped the Bible in there and he never read it. He always read his Penny Horribles. But on one occasion, while out to sea, he took this Bible and he started studying it. And on the basis of the Bible and the Bible alone, 
his whole demeanor changed. He stopped spitting, he stopped swearing, he stopped drinking, and he discovered the Sabbath in the Bible. And he wrote a treatise on the Sabbath, and he sent it out to the world. And James White managed to get hold of this treatise, and he read it, and he compared it with the scripture, and all of these people came together and started this great movement. This was not a church, this is a movement. And then there was Stephen Haskell. Now he became the first evangelist, as it were. He traveled to Australia, he preached in New Zealand, he preached in London, he went to Western Europe, to Southern Africa, to India, to China, to Japan, and he had this burden to preach the message. Now, you know, today this is no big deal, but then this was a big deal to go to all of those places. And he baptized people in China and in Japan with this message. And if you look at those early reformers, Ellen Harmon, 17 years old, George Amadon, 21, Bird, 20, Butler, 22, Daniels, 20, the oldest one, Hiram Edson, 37. Hull, Haskell, Loughborough, Sarah McEntiff, they were all in their 20s. This is very similar to what happened in the time of Jesus when he chose his disciples. They were all roughly this age. Because when you start a movement like this, you need energy and you need stamina and you need young people. And they were all not educated according to standard practice and they didn't attend the theological seminaries, just like John the Baptist. 1 Corinthians 1.26 For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised as He chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, so that no flesh may glory in his presence. But of him ye are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So yes, the movement was frowned upon by the theologians, and it is still frowned upon by theologians, but I wish to remind you that the greatest hero to ever have walked amongst men was born in a manger, was crucified on a cross, was rejected and despised. He was maligned, marginalized, misrepresented, even by those who supposedly serve him. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Isn't that the carpenter's son? Isn't he come out of Nazareth? Has anything good ever come from there? He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. It's incredible that the Jewish nation should take this magnificent messianic prophecy and apply it to the Jewish nation. It just doesn't work. John 17, 14, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and all the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? So here are these people with an eye hanging down there, eyes squint like that, leg off, 11 years old, out of school, teaches himself, a man who spits more and swears more than anyone else, a deist and a Freemason. And this is the pack that is supposed to unearth new truth out of the Bible or old truth in right settings. So how we bring to bring this final message? If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for battle? Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. So you must point to the law. You must be a John the Baptist. The last great conflict will be short writes Ellen White. It will be terrible. The last warnings must be given to the world. 
There's a special power in the presentation of truth at the present time, but how long will it continue? Only a little while. Decided effort should be made to bring the message for this time prominently before the people. It's not a popular message. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain. God will manifest his power. But as God poured out the early rain and brought people back to a realization of what salvation was about and obedience to God, so the same must happen at the end of time. 2 Corinthians 6, 1, We then as workers together with him beseech ye also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Just because you keep the law doesn't make you a legalist. If you talk to people and you say, do you want to be a murderer? No. Do you want to be a thief? No. Do you want to be a liar? No. But you don't want to keep the law. Does that make any sense? It doesn't make any sense at all. If you love God with all your heart, you won't have any strange gods before him. If you love God with all your heart, while you bow down to a stupid idol made of stone or something, it's pathetic. If you love God, you won't use his name in vain. You want to spend special time with him and he set a day aside for you to rest. What does rest mean? Does it mean to go and lie in a horizontal position and do a ceiling inspection? I don't think so. It means to rest in the completed works of God. How much more so in salvation, where you rest in the completed works of God, you acknowledge that you are a failure, you are a sinner, but he's your salvation. It's not legalism to keep the law of God. It's an acknowledgement that you rest in his completed work. So it's by grace and by grace and by grace that you are saved. Now did you know that there are only two truly worldwide religious movements in the world? Only two. The American Bible Society and Church Missions. And it's, it's a pathetic thing over here, but it tells you all the denominations and where they are, and only two are worldwide. Only two. The one is Roman Catholicism, and the other one is Seventh-day Adventism. Now, what does Rome teach? This is Roman Catholicism, not the creator of the universe in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, but the Catholic Church can claim the honor of having granted man a pause to his work every seven days. Reason and common sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives, either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday, or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. Who's saying that? It's Rome that's saying that, not me. So this is officially Roman Catholic teaching. And by the way, this occurred in the Catholic mirror December 23, 1893. Because in the United States they had a fair where they wanted to keep it open on a Sunday, an international fair. And they wanted to keep it open on a Sunday. And the churches complained to the state and the state said, fine, closed on Sunday. It's a day of rest. And the people complained and the Seventh-day Adventist church said, church and state are supposed to be separate. And therefore, it is unconstitutional to say that this is a religious day because the Bible teaches otherwise. And so the state actually, eventually, after a huge debate, relaxed them. And this is what the Roman Catholic Church wrote as a consequence. Reason and common sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of the alternatives, either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday, or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. Sunday is the day acknowledged, it's the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church. 
without a word of remonstrance from the Protestant world. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. This is from Cardinal Gibbons himself. So this is position of the Roman Catholic Church. This is not something we invented. Sunday is purely a creation of the Catholic Church, American Quarterly Review. Sunday is the law of the Catholic Church alone. The observance of Sunday by Protestants is a homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church, one after the other. The Protestants say, how can I receive the teaching of an apostate church? How, we ask, have you managed to receive a teaching all your life? in direct opposition to your recognized teacher, the Bible, on the Sabbath question. This is the Baltimore Catholic Mirror, 1893. Those who follow the Bible as their guide, the Israelites and the Seventh-day Adventists, have the exclusive weight of evidence on their side, whilst the biblical Protestant has not a word in self-defense for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday. Catholic Mirror answering to that debate. Catholic Mirror stated the Adventists are the only body of Christians with the Bible as their teacher who find no warrant in its pages for the change of day from the 7th to the 1st, hence their appellation Seventh-day Adventists. The Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath day to Saturday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by our founder Jesus Christ. Here they claim their infallibility, contrary to the Word of God. So the Protestant claiming to be the Bible as their only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. So here are two organizations going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. The one relatively small and despised, the other one massive, with the masses ecumenical movement, having gathered all religious movements under its wings. This is the St. Catholic's Catholic Sentinel, People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. Now, I was a Roman Catholic, and I studied the Bible, and I studied the prophecies. And I called the Roman Catholic priest, and I said to him, excuse me, will you please explain what's going on here? Here are the commandments in the Bible, and here are your commandments. Why are they different? He said, I'm not into scripture. I said, excuse me, you're a priest, and you're not into scripture? He said, no, I can bring you a specialist. And so I went and fetched a priest from another denomination, a Protestant denomination, and he came to my house, or a pastor, and I said, will you please explain this to me? And he hummed and hard and tried to explain it. And then we went to Daniel chapter 7. I said, this is what the reformers taught. <laughs> this is what you teach today. Can you please explain to me why? And he said, no, 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 we don't believe that anymore. I said, why not? He said, because the Antichrist was Antiochus Epiphanes IV. I said, excuse me, he was a Greek king, so he should have come out of the third kingdom. But the Bible says he comes out of the fourth kingdom. And we carried on like this, and he got up and closed the ears of his young protege who came with him and marched him out of my door. I was just asking questions. I didn't belong to any denomination. I was an atheist, and I discovered what the scriptures had said. Now this is what the Catholic Church said. Most Christians assume Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. Roman Catholic Church protests. It transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath to Sunday. And to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. Ha ha! That has to do with authority. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings only on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. And this was the note from the editor of that magazine. He says, the challenge by Rome is the same today. Either the Catholic Church is right or the Seventh-day Adventists are right. There's no other choice. And this is where we are. Now, how far will they go? This is the official webpage of the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic answers to questions. And it deals with Seventh-day Adventism. You can look it up, www.catholic.com. And it says, Seventh-day Adventism cannot change its view on the Catholic Church being the whore of Babylon. By the way, did Martin Luther teach that they were the whore of Babylon? Yes. Did Calvin teach it? Yes. Did Wesley teach it? 
Yes. Did Spurgeon teach it? Yes. Did all the great uh, scientists of the day teach it? Isaac Newton, did he teach it? Yes. Everybody taught it. So what's changed? So the Seventh-day Adventism cannot change its view on the Catholic Church being the whore of Babylon without admitting that it's wrong on the Sunday worship. It cannot admit that Sunday worship is not the mark of the beast without changing its view on the Jewish Sabbath. There's no such thing as a Jewish Sabbath. There's only a biblical Sabbath. Seventh-day Adventism cannot cease to be anti-Catholic without ceasing to be Seventh-day Adventism. And this was by the materials presented to the cardinals themselves that they put their stamp of approval on them. So that's a choice. You're either with this nutcase group or you're with Roman Catholicism. That's what they're saying. Well, what is your choice then? What was my choice? Do you think I joined this church because the people are so nice? <laughs> what is this? This is a hospital. This is a hospital. When the Good Samaritan came by, that man was all beaten up. And there he lay. And the Good Samaritan bound up his wounds and he poured wine and oil on them. What does wine and oil symbolize? Oil is the Holy Spirit and wine is doctrine. So he binds up his wounds. And the Pharisee had walked by and the man of the book had walked by and they were all on their way down from Jerusalem to a Jericho position, a cursed world, a cursed city. They all came from a state up there to a lower state. But the Samaritan, he put him on his own donkey and he took him to the inn. And when he took him to the inn, he said to the man, to the innkeeper, I will pay you whatever it takes you take care of this man. And then he said, and I will come again. And whatever you've done in addition, I will reward you. Who is the good Samaritan? It's Jesus Christ. And he left and he said, I will come again. What does he call his church? An inn. But what kind of inn? Where he took someone who was wounded and sick. And he said, take care of him. And whatever you do extra, I will repay you when I come again. This church is a hospital. This church is not a place that sits on a holy hill thinking that the sun shines out of it. This is a place where sin-sick people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their only Savior come and gather. And yes, it is a worldwide movement. And it has its institutions all over the world. This one is in, in Germany. This is another one in Germany. Hospitals. Did you know that the greatest hospital denomination in the world is the Roman Catholic Church? And which Protestant denomination has the greatest hospital input in the world? The Seventh-day Adventist Church. Isn't this incredible? And here is uh, the building in the right next to the Vatican. And there are some of the offices in Europe. This is the one in England, the college in England. This is a camp meeting in England. Here's St. Helena Hospital, Health Ministries, Loma Linda Hospital, and uh, Alternative Health Messages. And then hundreds of small little institutions all over the world teaching health practices, fitness, returning to healthful principles, printing presses, churning out. This is one of the little hospitals in Africa. If you are a tourist, you're a German tourist, and you want to go and visit Africa, when you go to the tourist people, they'll give you a pamphlet. And on it is a list of all the Seventh-day Adventist hospitals in Africa. And they'll tell you, if you get sick, Go to one of those. They have a good reputation. This is the college in Helderberg in South Africa. This is what it looks like. If you love me, keep my commandments. Not because you're better than others, but because you have been saved by grace. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. 
And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst say, Come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. What do you notice about this verse? People say, I want Jesus, but I don't need a denomination. I don't need a church. The Lord will lead me. The Spirit will lead me. What did he do when he called Paul? Did he say, I will pour my Spirit out upon you, and you will be my apostle to the Gentiles, and I will tell you exactly what you must do. Now go and do what I tell you. Did he do that? No. He sent him to his church. And what did the church members say to him? What did Ananias say? Lord, do you know what you're doing? Do you know this fellow? He's the most miserable person on the planet. He's been persecuting and killing your people left, right, and center, and now you want me to go and lay my hands on him and bless him and, and open his eyes? I'm scared of that guy. And yet he did it, didn't he? So God doesn't do anything separate from his church. Question, did God, did Jesus organize his early church, yes or no? Yes. They were ragtag, they came <coughs> out and, <coughs> and followed him. There was no organization in the beginning. Jesus had actually started an organization. He called 12 and then he ordained 70. Now that's fascinating because that's a type of the Old Testament where there were 70 elders. Did you know that the new translation totally destroys that by making it 77 and destroying the typology? Yeah, I like the old translation. It, I like to know what God said. I don't like to know what a theologian said. He thinks God said 70. And then didn't they choose elders and deacons and organize themselves? So God is a God of order. Why wouldn't he have order at the end of time? And the spirit and the what? And the bride say come. God doesn't work separate from the church. So this is a movement. This is not a holier-than-thou organization. This is a people who are blind and pitiful and poor and wretched and naked and need to get eyes solved and need to be healed in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And some will come in that are legalistic and some will come in that are, are liberal and it will be a melting pot and there will be pain. I'll tell you something. It stank on the ark. But if you weren't in the ark, you were outside the ark. And yes, there were funny creatures in the ark. And if you sat on a porcupine, you felt it. And there will be porcupines in this church. And there will be a rhinoceros behind you who will bump you till you fly off your chair. But you better stay in the ark. And it might smell here, and it does. I assure you, it smells in this ark. But it's not what we are, it's the message that we carry. And we have the privilege to carry this message, not because we're great, but because this is God's truth, the restoration of the final message to the world. Come and worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Get rid of all the spiritualism. This is the God of the sanctuary. We have a high priest, says Paul, who has gone into a sanctuary not made by human hands. And there he is ministering on our behalf. We have an advocate with the Father if we fall. This is a good news message. This is not a legalistic message. But God cannot be trifled with. If he threw the devil out the front door because he didn't keep God's commandments, do you think he's going to leave, let the sinners in by the back door to take his place? Surely if he has one set of standards for the devil and his angels, the same set of standards must count for the redeemed. You must come back into harmony with God's law. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And if you want to hear, then come. And if you're thirsty, then come. And whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It's a choice. It's not a compulsion. May the Lord bless us as we contemplate these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is a tough message to bear because it sounds so just mental. And who will bear it? 
Just like the disciples of old said, this is a tough message, who can bear it? And they walked away. And you went to your disciples and he said, do you also want to go? And they said, but Lord, you have the words of eternal life, where shall we go? And this is how I feel, Lord, and I'm sure many people feel that way. Where else can I go? This, this is the word of eternal life, I have no choice. And then your enemy says the same thing, choose. You're either with them or you're with us, but I'm going to crush you. But just as the three worthies were saved in the fire, so we can rely on the great arm of strength of the God of heaven. So empower and give us strength and give us courage and help us with humility so that we might rightly represent you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.